Chapter Two of Dorothy and the Wizard in Oz by L. Frank Baum. The Glass City. When Dorothy recovered her senses, they were still falling, but not so fast. The top of the buggy caught the air like a parachute or an umbrella filled with wind, and held them back so that they floated downward with a gentle motion that was not so very disagreeable to bear. The worst thing was their terror of reaching the bottom of this great crack in the earth, and the natural fear that sudden death was about to overtake them at any moment. Crash after crash echoed far above their heads, as the earth came together where it had split, and stones and chunks of clay rattled around them on every side. These they could not see, but they could feel them pelting the buggy top, and Jim screamed almost like a human being when a stone overtook him and struck his bony body. They did not really hurt the poor horse, because everything was falling together, only the stones and rubbish fell faster than the horse and buggy, which were held back by the pressure of the air, so that the terrified animal was actually more frightened than he was injured. How long this state of things continued, Dorothy could not even guess. She was so greatly bewildered. But by and by, as she stared ahead into the black chasm with a beating heart, she began to dimly see the form of the horse Jim, his head up in the air, his ears erect, and his long legs sprawling in every direction as he tumbled through space. Also turning her head, she found that she could see the boy beside her, who had until now remained as still and silent as she herself. Dorothy sighed and commenced to breathe easier. She began to realize that death was not in store for her after all, but that she had merely started upon another adventure, which promised to be just as queer and unusual as were those she had before encountered. With this thought in mind the girl took heart, and leaned her head over the side of the buggy to see where the strange light was coming from. Far below her she found six great glowing balls suspended in the air. The central and largest one was white, and reminded her of the sun. Around it were arranged, like the five points of a star, the other five brilliant balls, one being rose-colored, one violet, one yellow, one blue, and one orange. This splendid group of colored suns sent rays darting in every direction. And as the horse and buggy, with Dorothy and Zeb, sank steadily downward and came nearer to the lights, the rays began to take on all the delicate tintings of a rainbow, growing more and more distinct every moment, until all the space was brilliantly illuminated. Dorothy was too dazed to say much, but she watched one of Jim's big ears turn to violet and the other to rose and wondered that his tail should be yellow and his body striped with blue and orange, like the stripes of a zebra. Then she looked at Zeb, whose face was blue and whose hair was pink, and gave a little laugh that sounded a bit nervous. "'Isn't it funny?' she said. The boy was startled, and his eyes were big. Dorothy had a green streak through the center of her face, where the blue and yellow lights came together, and her appearance seemed to add to his fright. I, I don't s s see anything th funny about it, he stammered. Just then the buggy tipped slowly over upon its side, the body of the horse tipping also. But they continued to fall all together, and the boy and girl had no difficulty in remaining upon the seat, just as they were before. Then they turned bottom side up and continued to roll slowly over until they were right side up again. During this time Jim struggled frantically, all his legs kicking the air, but on finding himself in his former position, the horse said in a relieved tone of voice, "'Well, that's better.' Dorothy and Zeb looked at one another in wonder. "'Can your horse talk?' she asked. "'Never knew him to before,' replied the boy. "'Those were the first words I ever said,' called out the horse, who had overheard them, "'and I can't explain why I happened to speak then.' This is a nice scrape you've got me into, isn't it? As for that, we are in the same scrape ourselves, answered Dorothy, cheerfully. But never mind, something will happen pretty soon. Of course, growled the horse. 
and then we shall be sorry it happened. Zeb gave a shiver. All this was so terrible and unreal that he could not understand it at all, and so had good reason to be afraid. Swiftly they drew near to the flaming-colored suns, and passed close beside them. The light was then so bright that it dazzled their eyes, and they covered their faces with their hands to escape being blinded. There was no heat in the colored suns, however, and after they had passed below them, the top of the buggy shut out many of the piercing rays so that the boy and girl could open their eyes again. "'We've got to come to the bottom some time,' remarked Zeb with a deep sigh. "'We can't keep falling forever, you know.' "'Of course not,' said Dorothy. "'We are somewhere in the middle of the earth, and the chances are we'll reach the other side of it before long. But it's a big hollow, isn't it?' "'Awful big,' answered the boy. "'We're coming to something now,' announced the horse. At this they both put their heads over the side of the buggy and looked down. Yes, there was land below them, and not so very far away, either. But they were floating very, very slowly, so slowly that it could no longer be called a fall, and the children had ample time to take heart and look about them. They saw a landscape with mountains and plains, lakes and rivers, very like those upon the earth's surface, but all the scene was splendidly colored by the variegated lights from the six suns. Here and there were groups of houses that seemed to be made of clear glass because they sparkled so brightly. "'I'm sure we are in no danger,' said Dorothy in a sober voice. "'We are falling so slowly that we can't be dashed to pieces when we land.' And this country that we are coming to seems quite pretty. We'll never get home again, though, declared Zeb with a groan. Oh, I'm not so sure of that, replied the girl. But don't let us worry over such things, Zeb. We can't help ourselves just now, you know, and I've always been told it's foolish to borrow trouble. The boy became silent, having no reply to so sensible a speech and soon both were fully occupied in staring at the strange scene spread out below them. They seemed to be falling right into the middle of a big city which had many tall buildings with glass domes and sharp-pointed spires. These spires were like great spear-points, and if they tumbled upon one of them they were likely to suffer serious injury. Jim the horse had seen these spires also and his ears stood straight up with fear, while Dorothy and Zeb held their breaths in suspense. But, no, they floated gently down upon a broad flat roof, and came to stop at last. When Jim felt something firm under his feet, the poor beast's legs trembled so much that he could hardly stand. But Zeb at once leaped out of the buggy to the roof, and he was so awkward and hasty that he kicked over Dorothy's birdcage, which rolled out upon the roof so that the bottom came off. At once a pink kitten crept out of the upset cage, sat down upon the glass roof, and yawned and blinked its round eyes. Oh, said Dorothy, that's Eureka. First time I ever saw a pink cat, said Zeb. Eureka isn't pink, she's white. It's this queer light that gives her that color. "'Where's my milk?' asked the kitten, looking up into Dorothy's face. "'I'm most starved to death.' "'Oh, Eureka! Can you talk?' "'Talk? Am I talking? Good gracious, I believe I am. Isn't it funny?' asked the kitten. "'It's all wrong,' said Zeb gravely. "'Animals ought not to talk. But even old Jim has been saying things since we had our accident.' "'I can't see that it's wrong,' remarked Jim in his gruff tones. At least it isn't as wrong as some other things. What's going to become of us now? I don't know, answered the boy, looking about him curiously. The houses of the city were all made of glass, so clear and transparent that one could look through the walls as easily as through a window. Dorothy saw, underneath the roof on which she stood, several rooms used for rest chambers, and even thought she could make out a number of queer forms huddled into the corners of these rooms. The roof beside them had a great hole smashed through it, and pieces of glass were lying scattered in every direction. A nearby steeple had been broken off short, 
and the fragments lay heaped beside it. Other buildings were cracked in places, or had corners chipped off from them, but they must have been very beautiful before these accidents had happened to mar their perfection. The rainbow tints from the colored suns fell upon the glass city softly, and gave to the buildings many delicate shifting hues which were very pretty to see. But not a sound had broken the stillness since the strangers had arrived, except that of their own voices. They began to wonder if there were no people to inhabit this magnificent city of the inner world. Suddenly a man appeared through a hole in the roof next to the one they were on, and stepped into plain view. He was not a very large man, but was well formed and had a beautiful face, calm and serene as the face of a fine portrait. His clothing fitted his form snugly, and was gorgeously colored in brilliant shades of green, which varied as the sunbeams touched them, but was not wholly influenced by the solar rays. The man had taken a step or two across the glass roof before he noticed the presence of the strangers, but then he stopped abruptly. There was no expression of either fear or surprise upon his tranquil face. Yet he must have been both astonished and afraid, for after his eyes had rested upon the ungainly form of the horse for a moment, he walked rapidly to the furthest edge of the roof, his head turned back over his shoulder to gaze at the strange animal. "'Look out!' cried Dorothy, who noticed that the beautiful man did not look where he was going. "'Be careful or you fall off!' But he paid no attention to her warning. He reached the edge of the tall roof, stepped one foot out into the air, and walked into space as calmly as if he were on firm ground. The girl, greatly astonished, ran to lean over the edge of the roof, and saw the man walking rapidly through the air toward the ground. Soon he reached the street, and disappeared through a glass doorway into one of the glass buildings. "'How strange!' she exclaimed, drawing a long breath. "'Yes, but it's a lot of fun, if it is strange,' remarked the small voice of the kitten, and Dorothy turned to find her pet walking in the air a foot or so away from the edge of the roof. "'Come back, Eureka!' she called in distress. "'You'll certainly be killed!' "'I have nine lives,' said the kitten, purring softly, as it walked around in a circle, and then came back to the roof. But I can't lose even one of them by falling in this country, because I really couldn't manage to fall if I wanted to. Does the air bear up your weight? asked the girl. Of course, can't you see? And again the kitten wandered into the air and back to the edge of the roof. It's wonderful, said Dorothy. Suppose we let Eureka go down to the street and get someone to help us, suggested Zeb who had been even more amazed than Dorothy at these strange happenings. "'Perhaps we can walk on the air ourselves,' replied the girl. Zeb drew back with a shiver. "'I wouldn't dare try,' he said. "'Maybe Jim will go,' continued Dorothy, looking at the horse. "'And maybe he won't,' answered Jim. "'I have tumbled through the air long enough to make me contented on this roof.' "'But we didn't tumble to the roof,' said the girl. By the time we reached here we were floating very slowly, and I'm almost sure we could float down to the street without getting hurt. Eureka walks on the air all right. Eureka weighs only about half a pound, replied the horse in a scornful tone, while I weigh about half a ton. You don't weigh as much as you ought to, Jim, remarked the girl, shaking her head as she looked at the animal. You're dreadfully skinny. Oh, well, I'm old said the horse, hanging his head despondently. And I've had lots of trouble in my day, little one. For a good many years I drew a public cab in Chicago, and that's enough to make anyone skinny. He eats enough to get fat, I'm sure, said the boy gravely. Do I? Can you remember any breakfast that I've had today? growled Jim, as if he resented Zeb's speech. None of us has had breakfast, said the boy. And in a time of danger like this it's foolish to talk about eating. Nothing is more dangerous than being without food, declared the horse with a sniff, at the rebuke of his young master. And just at present no one can tell whether there are any oats in this queer country or not. 
If there are, they are liable to be glass oats. Oh, no, exclaimed Dorothy. I can see plenty of nice gardens and fields down below us, at the edge of this city, but I wish we could find a way to get to the ground. Why don't you walk? asked Eureka. I'm as hungry as the horse is, and I want my milk. Will you try it, Zeb? asked the girl, turning to her companion. Zeb hesitated. He was still pale and frightened, for this dreadful adventure had upset him and made him nervous and worried, but he did not wish the little girl to think him a coward, so he advanced slowly to the edge of the roof. Dorothy stretched out a hand to him, and Zeb put one foot out and let it rest in the air a little over the edge of the roof. It seemed firm enough to walk upon, so he took courage and put out the other foot. Dorothy kept hold of his hand and followed him, and soon they were both walking through the air, with the kitten frisking beside them. "'Come on, Jim,' called the boy. "'It's all right.' Jim had crept to the edge of the roof to look over, and, being a sensible horse and quite experienced, he made up his mind that he could go where the others did. So with a snort and a neigh and a whisk of his short tail, he trotted off the roof into the air, and at once began floating downward to the street. His great weight made him fall faster than the children walked, and he passed them on the way down, but when he came to the glass pavement, he alighted upon it so softly that he was not even jarred. "'Well, well,' said Dorothy, drawing a long breath. "'What a strange country this is!' People began to come out of the glass doors to look at the new arrivals, and pretty soon quite a crowd had assembled. There were men and women, but no children at all, and the folks were all beautifully formed and attractively dressed, and had wonderfully handsome faces. There was not an ugly person in all the throng, yet Dorothy was not especially pleased by the appearance of these people, because their features had no more expression than the faces of dolls. They did not smile, nor did they frown, or show either fear, or surprise, or curiosity, or friendliness. They simply stared at the strangers, paying most attention to Jim and Eureka, for they had never before seen either a horse or a cat, and the children bore an outward resemblance to themselves. Pretty soon a man joined the group who wore a glistening star in the dark hair just over his forehead. He seemed to be a person of authority, for the others pressed back to give him room. After turning his composed eyes first upon the animals and then upon the children, he said to Zeb, who was a little taller than Dorothy, "'Tell me, intruder, was it you who caused the rain of stones?' For a moment the boy did not know what he meant by this question. Then he remembered the stones that had fallen with them and passed them long before they had reached this place. He answered, "'No, sir, we didn't cause anything. It was the earthquake.' The man with the star stood for a time quietly thinking over this speech. Then he asked, "'What is an earthquake?' "'I don't know,' said Zeb, who was still confused. But Dorothy, seeing his perplexity, answered, it's a shaking of the earth. In this quake a big crack opened, and we fell through, horse and buggy and all, and the stones got loose and came down with us. The man with the star regarded her with his calm, expressionless eyes. The rain of stones has done much damage to our city, he said, and we shall hold you responsible for it unless you can prove your innocence. How can we do that? asked the girl. That I am not prepared to say. It is your affair, not mine. You must go to the house of the sorcerer, who will soon discover the truth. Where is the house of the sorcerer? the girl inquired. I will lead you to it. Come. He turned and walked down the street, and after a moment's hesitation Dorothy caught Eureka in her arms and climbed into the buggy. The boy took his seat beside her and said, Get up, Jim. As the horse ambled along, drawing the buggy, the people of the glass city made way for them and formed a procession in their rear. Slowly they moved down one street and up another, turning first this way and then that, until they came to an open square in the center of which was a big 
glass palace having a central dome and four tall spires on each corner. End of chapter 2